Us is Dim, the title of the current Pazuti exhibition and a fitting place for us to begin our conversation. Who is us and who is them? We are both, in my opinion. I think that's um, one of the really fascinating things to consider is to someone else, we are a them. And to us, we are us. And in America, where there is so much about division, cultural, economic, social, ethnic, uh, linguistic, geographic, we're always slicing these pies. But within each of us, um, we probably are on multiple sides of the pie. With us as them, thinking about this moment, this particular historic moment, thinking about the Barack Obama uh, presidency, uh, is there a, a sense of post-raciality to the us is them ethos? I don't know. I, I struggle with post-raciality because I don't believe in race and I contend with it all the time. Um, but I am always coming from the perspective of um, trying to remind myself that its significance only is in our ability to um, fabricate it in our minds on a daily basis. When you say that you don't believe in race, uh, what do you mean? Um, is that uh, a rejection of race as a biological construct or is it also a, a sort of repudiation of race as a, a sort of social construct? Both. I don't think either of them have any actual borders or aren't grounded in any sense of reality. And that's just a, a natural fact that we each choose to ignore on a, on a regular basis. Like my skin is brown, although in the United States I identify as black and or African American. So that's a, a denial of reality. And there are no white people yet. I categorize certain people as white. And that's not a social or, bi or um, phenotypical description of anyone. So. Um, and then, of course, when we travel outside of the United States, we recognize, especially in Southeast Asia, that people can be as dark as I am. And in Northern Asia, they can be lighter than the lightest, quote, quote unquote, white person, but they're all considered Asian. So I, I really um, struggle to figure out where the boundaries of, of race um, are and their relevance in actually the 21st century. So I don't think it's post-racial. I think it's just trying to f get closer to reality. Would you agree or disagree uh, that even as race remains something that is biologically and to some degree socially insignificant in terms of its realness, do you believe that it has real political and social consequences? Of course, that's why I want to get rid of it. Because uh, the craziest thing about blackness is that black people didn't create it that Europeans with a commercial interest in dehumanizing people uh, created a subhuman brand, which we've um, allowed um, to define us. Uh, and, and, we've, and they've um, allowed to, to limit their own um, selves through this kind of um, really obscure and damaging um, way of categorizing human beings. When I think about us as them, all right, sort of returning us back to, back to that phrase, I, I'm sort of reminded of a sense of empathy, a sense of identifying with the other, right? Um, um, sort of draws upon MLK's assertion that, uh, that um, we're all you know, sort of caught up in this uh, inescapable network of mutuality. What affects uh, one directly affects all of us indirectly. Um, thinking about some of the, some of the current events uh, that are taking place in news, uh, the terrorist attack on Charlie Hebdo, uh, the events in Ferguson, the, the uh, death of Eric Garner, how do those events affect us indirectly? Huh. How would you describe indirectly? Uh, thinking about uh, King's argument that injustice uh, anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, that we do not feel that moment uh, certainly, uh, from a visceral standpoint, we feel each of those events. And yet, it is Michael Brown's murder, it is Eric Garner's murder, it's the 
uh, death of those journalists at Charlie Hebdo. So that uh, it affects them more directly than it affects us. And yet, uh, if, we, if we judge the statement that we are all caught up in this inescapable uh, network of mutuality, and even if we think about uh, the, the idea behind us as them, this, this sense of identifying uh, with others, particularly as they endure struggles, right? Uh, particularly as they try to pursue freedom uh, or, or deal with the human condition, how do those events then have an effect on us? And how should we be drawn in to trying to resolve them? Right. I guess I, I, when, what struck me when you said that how do they do, uh, affect us indirectly is that even if I am not physically injured by an event or a, a close family member is not physically injured by an event, psychologically, uh, I can be altered, damaged, and affected very directly from these um, these events. And I think the way in which fear um, of the quote-unquote other is produced through um, actions uh, that are seen based upon group politics uh, you know, have long-term direct effects on all of us. So the attacks on Charlie Hebdo were, they, they were not Muslim, you know, it was not a Muslim attack, but it's right. been kind of defined as a Muslim attack against the West, against, you know, Judaism, against other, but that's not the case. These were specific people acting upon their own specific agendas towards other people who they thought were on a different um, trajectory. And the reality is that on any given day, there's they some. It's it's funny. On any given day, they might find themselves to have more in common with each other than they d they don't have with with one another. And in in any political movement or moment, um, especially in what appear to be opposing sides, they tend to have a deeper understanding of one another than those of us who are not as directly engaged in it. And that's where I, I try to talk about us and us as them, is that um, it came actually out of an experience during the war between Hezbollah and Israel and being at an artist residency with artists from 20 different countries and it was during the World Cup. And so there was always, already a level of, of nationalism, which is kind of close to racism, <laughs> happening. Um, and then the war broke out and all of the other artists kind of didn't know how to deal with the Palestinian artists there and the Israeli artists there. And at some point, first they were on opposite sides of every room, and then at some point they wound up being the only people who could really talk to one another about it because they actually had something in common in that they were experiencing a long um, cultural and physical battle between the nations, I guess, um, that the rest of us could kind of relate to, but not really. So they became an us. So is the challenge then uh, trying to uh, dismantle those categories, trying to uh, sort of uh, demonstrate how we're all involved in the sort of uh, uh, tragedies that, that befall uh, um, certain individuals? In other words, uh, when, when you have, again, the, the death of uh, Michael Brown, is it seeing how that debt also strikes against us personally? Uh, does that allow us then to uh, have a, a, a greater interest in trying to uh, deal with the sort of prevailing inequities that um, permeate society? I believe so. I think the ultimate goal is for empathy, you know, to recognize, I mean, all living beings, but especially in human beings, that we are a part of one another and what negatively affects any of us actually negatively affects all of us. And the, the longer and the more that we choose to actually be divisive, um, the more likely we actually will wind up not only ostracizing others, but ostracizing ourselves. And as an African-American male and uh, who's had a great opportunity to travel all over the world, and especially several countries not enough, on the continent of Africa, I recognize that blackness is not so easily kind of contained and defined, not only on the continent, but also in the United States, that um, 
within every African American male who are who there are you know, thousands of identities. We are not just gender and skin complexion. We are constantly evolving individuals and no action of one you know black male can actually dictate the actions of all others um, or even most others for that matter and i think the more that we can actually allow ourselves to see each person as a unique individual the better off all of us are in, in when it comes to situations where we might be profiled by a police officer based off of two things and they say well there are probably a lot of more things about this person that are relevant to the situation than um, their age and gender or ethnicity. So I think um, trying to kind of put that, um, you know, second, what is it called? Like a, um, a reset button or some kind of fail safe button in, in the back of all of our minds before we react um, to an individual based off of complexion or, or gender. Um, that we really see that you know they might be, look different than us, they might sound different than us, but we still likely have more things in common than them with them than we do not. Right, right. No, I, I certainly agree that we are uh, not a monolith. Um, there's a certain way in which um, identity markers can burden us. Uh, let's uh, shift the discussion to your artistic and intellectual biography. Um, who or what influences your work? Well, I'm definitely influenced by the the notion of a grand narrative in history because it's so easy to believe and so easy to buy into. Um, I'm influenced by popular culture and advertising because it's so easy to believe and to buy into. I mean, I'm, I guess I would say I'm influenced by the things that seduce me the most. And because my mother, Deborah Willis, is a photographer and art historian who spent a lot of her life actually looking at how um, we can unearth alternative histories through looking at some of the same archives that have been ignored. Um, that quote unquote black history um, is really not just black history, it's American history. Uh, and the, the need to recognize that American history aren't, isn't just about the people who we made statues of and that we built houses around and named streets for that American history is probably more about the people whose names we'll never know. But only through um, the devotion, the intellect and the expertise of photographers um, in the 19th century of, 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 of African descent, do we at least get to see some of the faces of of African Americans who stare back at all of the caricatures and stereotypes that were used um, to to minimize our humanity, and and say that this is not that that's not the true story. The idea of the African savage, the buffoon, um, is you know it's a mythology, you know, of the highest order. Let's complicate. Uh the, the sort of grand narratives that emerge in our current um, period. Uh, you once said that what we choose to remember is often not as important as what is forgotten. When we look back in 50 years, in your estimation, what will be forgotten about this current moment? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to believe the Tea Party will have been forgotten. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think I'm sure this moment will be marked as the moment where racism <laughs> ceased to exist or something of that nature. I think it, it might be forgotten um, that um, violence um, against you know people of African descent and the indigenous peoples of the United States that continue to happen um, was pervasive and that um, this was as much uh, an era of struggle um, for, for quote unquote minorities as it was for, uh, as it was a moment of, uh, of success and opportunity. Which is interesting because uh, 
so much of uh, the way in which this grand narrative is already being shaped um, stems out of the Obama presidency and what that what what his president uh, presidency means for this uh, particular era. Um, how do how do we reconcile uh, those sort of triumphs uh, in the midst of chaos that uh, even as he uh, sits in the White House, right, that there are still uh, uh, vulnerabilities that um, people all across uh, the country as well as the world, particularly minorities, um, particularly black bodies, uh, suffer. How do we reconcile the two? Or do we? Well, we, we can very easily. It, it's America. And one person um, at the top, so-called, uh, you, know, uh, you know, presumably at the top <laughs> or in power, cannot control 300 million people all at once and 300 million people who are at least encouraged uh, to have rugged independence, right? So um, there's, there's those issues. There's also um, the fact that our, our country has, was founded on and has been fueled by um, free or underpaid labor of uh, caste minorities from the beginning. And so the election of one person who was not a member of that caste minority, you know, a uh, person who, uh, yeah, the election of someone is not going to like shift everything. I, I'm a avid supporter of, of the president, not just because, not at all because he is quote unquote black, um, pr actually because he's as quote unquote, as so called, he's as white as he is black. And, and, and for some reason people want to ignore that. And he's not a descendant of a slave. You know, he's, he's, he's a child of an immigrant and was raised in a state that was 2% black, <laughs> that has a lot more com complex notions of identity than we are used to on the mainland. And I think uh, when we try to deduce our, our president's identity, his ethnicity into like one or two things, we kind of are ignoring the actual complexity of his making, which I think is what allowed him to become the first visibly multi-ethnic president. It's, 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 it's interesting that you say that. I, I think there's a sense in which um, there's a reverse one drop rule going on, that we build these certain fictive kinships so that the president has to um, embody blackness because through him then we have a sense of achievement and triumph. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit. In the wake of Michael Brown's murder, Hands up, don't shoot became a rallying cry. Um, your work displaying sculpted arms lifted in the air became an artistic symbol uh, for this call of justice, this idea of pushing back against extra legal violence or state sanctioned violence. Um, it was featured at the Art Basel, uh, appeared in, on Beyonce's website. Uh, you could find it all over uh, social media. Um, as an artist who engages branding, how important is it for everyday persons and Beyonce uh, to interpret your work or use it as a part of uh, broader movements, undertakings, and understandings? Well, it's extremely important for me because I am much more influenced by Beyonce than I am uh, Picasso. And, you know, there are, with it, whatever we call the, 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 the giants of art history, don't have a greater impact on my daily basis, my daily life than um, the pop icons and you know the people who are on the street. So, um, visual art is my language. It is, it, it, but it's a language with a deep, uh, rich history that I don't always understand. Uh, but I was uh, raised in in this moment of uh, pervasive um, media consumption and became literate in it through osmosis. And so using the language of popular culture and media to make art um, is li literally just kind of like speaking uh, um, the language, it's like my native tongue. Whereas I think fine art um, is a, a, a cousin <laughs> of that language. Can branding, uh, corporatism, 
um, media culture? Can, can, can the confluence of those things uh, enable uh, a human justice project to be undertaken? Can they help us to pursue, uh, say, gender, racial, uh, social, political equality? I think so. I mean, I think well, the reason I'm interested in using advertising is because it is the most ubiquitous language in the world. Uh, branding, I mean, branding isn't just about putting a sign on something. We know that now we can see um, a few colors, red, white, and blue. <laughs> and there's a meaning in that, you know. Uh, they mean liberty, even though they don't, may not just mean the United States. They mean France and, and England. Uh, but there are these ways in which um, branding has always been, uh, has always existed, you know. Nazism was a brand. Uh, um, nonviolence, nonviolent resistance was a brand. Um, the Nation of Islam was a brand. There and actually, the more clearly defined the brand, the easier it is to the Black Panthers, for example. The easier it is to to designate. Um, so, with with whatever movement there is, whether it be the Tea Party, and we don't hear pro life nearly as much either. It's anti-abortion. But I'm interested in, in, in how branding is kind of always used. And, but I always go back to the fact that race is the most successful advertising campaign of all time. The fact that you could take people from a huge and diverse continent like Africa where they have thousands of religions and cultures, worldviews, um, you know, kidnap people and package them into ships and send them halfway across the world and tell them, they're all the same. Um, to me, that's, I call it absolute power. That is the, the actually the, the de definition of, of successful branding. You know, the fact that I see myself as part of something that was, you know, really, that, that never could exist in, 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 in a singular way. One of the more fascinating pieces uh, that you've created is the absolute power uh, kind of, you know, uh, presenting that double entendre um, of sorts. Um, one of the more provocative pieces uh, that you that you have uh, created uh, features Nike symbols, right, uh, branded on the chest of a black man. And when I see it, I'm I'm, I'm reminded of how uh, the degree to which individuals have to uh, constantly market themselves. That. Uh, part of that, that they have to tolerate branding um, in order to increase marketability. And yet when we, you know, sort of look back over history, so we go back to Africa, and thinking about how branding represented beautification. Uh, and then you go into the uh, slavery period where uh, branding could decrease uh, one's marketability. If you had uh, a certain amount of bruises, uh, it could uh, uh, be a symbol of your unruliness. And, um, and so it would decrease your marketability. How do we reconcile uh, those, those permutations through time? That uh, branding goes from beautification to a sense of damaged goods to now uh, commodification. Well, I think in all, I think within a work of art, you can talk about all of those things at once. You don't have to be speaking about one thing or another. I think that's the beauty of it that when I made the piece scarred chest, and I did call it scarred chest, not branded chest. There was another one called branded chest, but I called it scarred chest because I wanted to reference both scarification and branding, and 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 the then and the now, and the us and the them. Good. Um, it has been seven years since you published uh, your monograph, Pitch Blackness. Um, what about the world that you conceptualized then? Has, has remained with us, uh, has fundamentally remained with us. And, and what would you say, uh, what would you point to as one of the biggest changes? Well, when the, that book was actually published during the run up to the election of Barack Obama, and I think when we were making it, I don't know if I knew who was gonna be the president, et cetera, but I recognized um, that traditional notions of what a black male in America should represent were going to change. And I 
I think we've all seen a, a, a huge um, change in, in the, the visibility of people of African descent, people uh, of, um, of Asian um, descent and, and from all over the, the Americas. Um, the representation in the media and all over the cultural landscape has become uh, much more nuanced, much more uh, thoughtful, and you know it can't it can't be ignored. You, you when you see, um, you know, just look at look <laughs> look at the top shows on television. It, you know, they most of them would have been unthinkable just seven years ago. True. True. Um, a lot of your work engages um, sport and popular culture. Uh, a couple of years ago, in the wake of the Donald Sterling remarks, uh, there are these um, racially insensitive remarks, and he received uh, criticism across the board from a lot of persons. Um, one in particular, probably the most famous uh, athlete in the world, LeBron James. And so LeBron James not only criticized uh, Donald Sterling's remarks, but also challenged the NBA to remove him from his ownership of the LA Clippers. Uh, a year later, he resigned with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, and if you recall, when he departed the Cavaliers, the owner of the team had some uh, very uh, uh, sort of uh, scathing missive. Um, against LeBron that actually stayed on the team's website up until the time that he returned. Uh, and some people felt that uh, his remarks carried racial undertones. Is that the, is that the basketball player, Duncan in the Noose, uh, that you depict in your work? Is it the basketball player who is, uh, has the chain uh, strapped to his ankle? I, I don't know. I think that would be for someone else to say, I think. Uh, I make the work hoping that it will be relevant to a variety of scenarios over an extended period of time. And wanting to make work that is uh, both commentary but also open-ended. I think in the case of uh, LeBron James and the Cavaliers, I think it's important to remember that he gets play, paid to play basketball and gets paid better than anybody else to play basketball. And so when it comes to that reality, I don't think we, I mean, why does someone get paid so much to put a ball through a hoop? You know, is that an extraordinary feat? Is that harder than raising four children on your own? I don't think so. But um, if he can make money doing it, more power to him. And whoever he chooses to play for, whoever can make the most money for him and off of him, um, that's kind of his own decision to make. And I think, um, was exciting about this generation of athletes, primarily because of advances in technology like social media, um, they can use their voices to make an impact and they can actually raise their visibility, not just um, on the, the court, but also in how they present themselves and how they talk about issues off the court, which I think we saw for a good 30 years um, when athletes were getting paid very well, they actually would not speak unless they were speaking for a corporate brand and so i think it's exciting to see athletes who can speak the corporate language but also can speak from a personal perspective as well and i'm excited about that uh thinking about uh athletes using their visibility to address uh these larger social questions uh were you encouraged by uh the basketball players lebron james derrick rose others who uh, wore the i can't breathe t-shirts um what did that uh, do for you? What did it symbolize? Well, it symbolized that they all are kind of getting to the point, like the most people, most, like many people in our country, where they don't feel like they have a choice but to actually do something, however small a gesture it is, um, to make a statement. And it used to be said that, okay, shut up, just play basketball. And now I think a lot of people are saying, well, I'm, I don't play basketball 24 7. <laughs> you know, I don't most of what I care about, most of what I think about in my life isn't just sports, it's my family, it's um, our country, it's the things that are going on in the world, and these are just small ways for them to actually acknowledge that. And 
I really, I mean, we, we saw a lot of kind of events like Rodney King, um, the riots in LA that kind of went kind of unspoken about, you know, a lot of athletes didn't even speak about. Um, we never really hear them endorsing presidential candidates even up until recently. And so maybe this is another byproduct of the election of Barack Obama that um, more um, people feel that they can use their voices and they can use also the benefits from marketing and branding be to actually speak about broader social issues. You know, So it's not just the appropriation of the corporation of the movement, but also sometimes members of the corporation of the movement <laughs> appropriating the, the corporate um, venues and avenues for their own agendas. One of the more brilliant aspects, returning back to Black Lives uh, Matter, one of the more brilliant aspects to me about uh, that slogan, right, about that phrase, is that it's, it's sort of difficult to dispute it, right? Uh, it's not uh, police in black communities are, is, is wrong. Um, it's not cops are racist. It's simply Black Lives Matter. And, and to dispute it would almost uh, be, uh, would, would uh, uh, come off as borderline racist, right? Um, and yet, there's uh, also a part of the us as them ethos uh, contained inside it. Um, my question is, why then is it so difficult uh, for there to be a sort of sustained value or empathy for uh, black bodies that endure extra legal violence? Well, I think for one reason, I think uh, in many cases, so-called black bodies are seen as extra legal. And I, I've, although I have a lot of respect for the women who coined the phrase Black Lives Matter and have um, continued to uh, promote and project uh, the importance of our lives and keep the movement going, uh, the women and many other people, um, I've always had issues with the term Black Lives Matter because, again, I don't believe in black lives. I believe in life. Right. So I, I think all lives matter, and I think um, the, any time we try to divide it, we might have an agenda, which it's a great brand, which I'm not gonna hate on. But I mean, if you have to say black lives matter, you actually are, it's almost an, an, <laughs> it's almost an affirmation that it's, it should be a question. You know, I would like to reach the point in, in the next few years where a person walking through their neighborhood is seen as a person walking through their neighborhood, <laughs> not as um, a kind of person walking through their neighborhood. You know, and I think the lo as long as we categorize, okay, this is a black, then he's brown, <laughs> you know, a uh, person. <laughs> You know, that we have to like, okay, now I have to negotiate this nonsense. You know, why can't I just walk through my neighborhood and be walking through my neighborhood? Why do I have to even be conscious of like, I've had scenarios where I'm like, oh, I'm a black man in this environment and I have to be like, no, why am I having to deal with your neurosis? So it's not even that, it's it's not that black lives don't, or uh, it should not be black lives matter and it should not be even that human lives matter. It should be that each individual is uh, given a certain uh, respect uh, to, to move about uh, society freely without having uh, certain challenges or uh, being the subject of uh, random acts of violence. I, it should not be a question in anyone's mind, <laughs> you know, that we even saw in Alabama that the, the father of the, is an East a, in, a South Asian and Indian man walk, who didn't speak very much English was, uh, brutalized by the police uh, because someone saw a skinny black man walking through the neighborhood. You know, and to see black by American standards? No, but with complexion standards, yes. <laughs> There's all kinds of ways in which um, the, there is this kind of slippage in, in, in the point that's being made when we talk about Black Lives Matter. Was he, how come he was not kind of brought into that Black Lives Matter conversation, you know? Is, uh, I, I really, think the more of us, I think, there, I don't believe in minorities. I believe we are all the majority. And the more of us that can recognize 
that we're in the majority, the greater power that we have towards collective movement for equal justice. Right. What I, what I hear is that while you don't uh, accept the concept of race, uh, you, you buy into this degree of uh, uh, interracial cooperation in so much as each of us uh, recognize uh, how uh, the, the sort of fundamental relationships that we have in terms of how uh, we respond to injustice as well as how we think about liberty or pursue freedom or, or just grapple with the human condition. Um, I, I would say that I believe I, my language as an American and specifically as an African-American, is to see race. I see. But I've been put in several positions in Africa and in Europe and even in Asia where my notion of race was seen as absurd because a quote-unquote light-skinned black person is not necessarily black in South Africa, for instance, or in Belgium. They're, the so I, rec I can talk about race and interracial blah, blah, blah in the American context, but it's just like, you know, you step outside of these boundaries. boundaries, you have to think about from a global perspective. And I think the global struggles, um, whether it be the p people who are um, Sunni, um, you know, versus Shiite who right. see themselves as almost like a racial divide. The, you know, there's all kinds of, in Ireland, you know, with their... Lithuanian Poland versus the earlier Irish populations see themselves on racial ba ba borders. And so I, I'm really recognizing that race is just as a way to categorize someone as different from us. But from my perspective, I looked at Ireland, they're all the same. <laughs> so that's where the us is them is always coming from, you know. Whereas I, I, I might go to Nigeria and people will say, like, oh, you're not one of us. Clearly, by looking at you, you're one of them but somebody from the U.S. might see me <laughs> as one of them. Right. And so I'm, it's not about cooperation, et cetera. It's just like the reality is that we're all mixed up in melange and there's a context that, um, that affects our, the way that others see us, you know. And the more that we can recognize the, the greater context, the, the, the complexity of that, I think the easier it will be to grapple with what appear to be the hard issues of today. One of your exhibits is the truth boot. For Hank Thomas, what is the truth? The truth is, I hope to find out one day. Good. And uh, what's next for you? Well, what's next is, is, is really, I think, steps towards um, liberation, not necessarily anything other than uh, the, you know, the emancipation of the mind, trying to, to see the world as I know it to be, not as what I see it to be. Thank you. Thank you.